Asset protection trusts, what are they? And do you really need one? Hi, I'm Jeff Hampton with STR Law Guys. I wanna welcome you to our YouTube channel. Today I wanna to talk about specifically asset protection trusts. What are they? There's a lot of bad information out there about whether someone needs a trust, whether they're actually needed for asset protection, and do you need a domestic asset protection trust, a foreign asset protection trust? Well, I wanna break this down from A to Z, give you everything you need to know about asset protection trusts. By the way, if you wait around to the end of this video, I'll also give you a free ebook, Five st Strategies to Protect Your Short-Term Rentals and Give You Peace of Mind. Okay, so when you start talking about asset protection trusts, they're very popular. Listen, the more you obtain wealth, particularly as you accumulate wealth, you become a bigger target. I mean, think about this for a second. As you begin to accumulate more and more, whether it just be liquid assets, whether it's cash, whether it's brokerage accounts, um, even whether you're talking about real estate, no matter what it is, you become a bigger target for a lawsuit. In fact, we all know this, the United States is the most litigious country in the entire world. More lawsuits in the U.S. than anywhere else. So you have to take particularly types, uh, particular types of measures to protect yourself from getting sued. Of course, we know asset protection trusts are very popular, but there's a lot of bad information out there about asset protection trusts as well. So can they protect you? Yes. Do you need one? It depends. So here's the best way we can break this down. Let's first start with what is arguably the most protective of asset protection trusts, the foreign asset protection trust. Okay. Now, when you look at this, Essentially, the very first asset protection, the first foreign asset protection trust, we find all the way back in 1984 in the Cook Islands. The very first statute that ever came up was the Cook Islands Trust Act in 1984. And essentially, it was a law that was passed that allow, allowed for the very first asset protection trust to be used by people in other countries. So one of the things we find is it provided this. Here's what it does. A foreign asset protection trust provides statutory non-recognition of any other jurisdiction's judgments. Now, what does that mean? That means if somebody gets, if you get a judgment against you in Canada, maybe you get a lawsuit that's brought against you in Canada and you lose, well, if you have a Cook Islands trust with property in that Cook Islands trust, then there's essentially statutory non-recognition. That means Cook Islands will not recognize that judgment from another country, okay? Including the United States. So I used Canada as an example, but it's also applicable for the United States. So if you have a judgment against you and they take it to the Cook Islands, basically the Cook Islands will say, no, nope, you're worthless. We're not even gonna recognize that you exist. So you can see how this would be somewhat attractive. Now, here's the thing. So some additional benefits that come from a foreign asset protection trust, whenever an attorney tries to bring a lawsuit against that Cook Islands trust, they have to start over from the very beginning, which means the moment you begin to start thinking about bringing that lawsuit, you can't bring it and then amend your filings and then keep coming back and forth. This happens in the United States all the time. In other words, there's no fishing expeditions. It doesn't allow an attorney to go in, figure out, fish around what's going on, and then amend their, their petition and their filings to try to amend their lawsuit. If you try to do that, you get your lawsuit thrown out makes it difficult on an attorney trying to bring the lawsuit. Additionally, the burden of proof is different. In the United States, civil courts are more of a 51 to 49% preponderance of the evidence, tilting the scales type of an approach on civil cases. But in the Cook Islands, it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The same standard that they use in criminal cases in the United States, the highest burden in the land. Okay. Also, no contingency fees are allowed in the Cook Islands. Well, listen, most people that hire an attorney that want to bring a lawsuit against someone, they end up bringing it on a contingency fee, particularly if someone was seriously injured. Maybe you have a rental property. Maybe someone was injured in a very serious way. Well, in that situation, you're going to end up having a hard time finding an attorney, and it forces you that if you can't hire an attorney on a contingency fee, it forces the person who is injured to have to pay the lawyer on an hourly rate. I can add up very quickly, okay? So finally, the loser pays the costs and fees of the winner. So if you lose, if you bring that lawsuit and it doesn't turn out well for you, you gotta pay for all the fees and costs of the other side, right? So it creates a little bit of a disincentive to bring a lawsuit from the very beginning. Now, and I also want you to understand, and you can go research this, but the statute of limitations to bring a lawsuit in the Cook Islands is much shorter than what you'll find in the United States. Notice how the entire Trust Act is really 
structured to create a disincentive for people to bring lawsuits against a foreign asset protection trust. So here's the reality of it. Most lawyers will never bring a lawsuit against a foreign asset protection trust out of the Cook Islands because it's too expensive and it's too risky. Now, I've given you all the good things, all the advantages of a foreign asset protection trust. Are there disadvantages? Yeah, there are fairly significantly. Here's some of the downsides. Number one, it's very expensive to set up. It can run you anywhere between forty dollars to $75,000 to set it up, and usually a minimum of $10,000 a year to maintain a foreign asset protection trust, particularly out of the Cook Islands. It also requires you to file a host of different IRS tax filings. You have to file a Form 3520, a Form 3520A each year with the IRS. You must do a full disclosure of all your assets and your roles. And if your assets are actually end up, you end up moving them offshore, which many attorneys will recommend, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, or known as the FATCA, applies, and it will require additional reporting requirements to the IRS every single year. So there's a lot more maintenance that has to go into maintaining a foreign asset protection trust. Also, you lose, here's the biggest downside. And this is why it's difficult for it to apply to rental real estate, short-term rentals specifically. If you end up having your assets link over to this foreign asset protection trust, you lose control of trust assets. And here's why. It, when you set that up that way, you are no longer in control. You are not the trustee. In order to set up a foreign asset protection trust, you must have a foreign trustee in control of all those assets. And so as a result of that, they have actual legal title to those trust assets. Now, you might be listed as the beneficiary, and it's true. The trustee must act on behalf of that beneficiary, meaning to potentially you. But the problem is they don't have to pay you. And if it protects the trusts, they can deny any request that you have. And in fact, this is one of the biggest problems with using a foreign asset protection trust with short-term rentals. Now, a lot of people will use this foreign asset protection trust in the form of what they call a hybrid trust, which it will link over seas in the event. Like, here's the way we explain it. During peacetime, everything's fine. It's used as a domestic trust, kind of a living, uh, a living trust uh, for estate planning purposes. But the moment you get sued, it'll link over seas to the Cook Islands. And at that moment, that foreign trustee takes over, and now you have no control of your assets. Well, think about this for a second. Imagine having to pay your cleaner. Imagine having to pay all your expenses. Imagine having to move money around in order to keep up with these properties. The problem is now you have to go ask for permission from a foreign trustee to do anything. So it makes it very difficult to manage a real estate portfolio in this sort of arrangement. That being said, let me give you some, uh, some specific case law that shows that foreign asset protection trusts have been effective. Number one, you've got the FTC versus Affordable Media back in 1995. In that particular case, the FTC tried to break a Cook Islands trust. And so you're talking about the Federal Trade Commission, a very serious, you know, substantial uh, federal government action here that came forward. And the best they could do is get a temporary injunction freezing those assets. And later on, they ended up settling for, for literally pennies on the dollar. I think it ended up being like 10 cents on the dollar to resolve the whole thing. So the Federal Trade Commission couldn't get through a foreign asset protection trust. But number two, you also have the U.S. versus Gant, uh, Grant case in 2008. This Grant case was an example of where the uh, IRS tried to attack a Cook Islands trust. It was kind of a crazy case. And the reality of it is, though, the IRS failed. They weren't able to get through that Cook Islands trust because of the way that it was set up. Then you also find the SEC versus Solo, which is 2010. There, the Securities and Exchange Commission actually tried to get through a Cook Islands Foreign Asset Protection Trust. They failed too. So you're talking about the IRS, you're talking about the SEC, you're talking about the Federal Trade Commission was unable to successfully get through a Foreign Asset Protection Trust out of the Cook Islands. Okay, now that's one option. Problem is it's not practical for most people. Too expensive, you can't maintain and control your assets. Maybe it's great if you're Bill Gates or Warren Buffett and you just have a bunch of brokerage accounts. Maybe that's a good application. The problem is, what about another option? What instead, instead of going overseas, what about a foreign, I'm sorry, what about a domestic asset protection trust? Well, I'm going to go very quickly on these. Essentially, they began to become modeled after the Cook Islands Trust. Starting in 1998, you'll find Alaska was the first domestic asset protection trust that went into effect. It attempted to duplicate the Cook Islands Trust domestically in the United States. And so there's 19 states currently that have this in effect. You've got Alaska, Delaware, Hawaii, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, Oklahoma, Nevada, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Indiana, South Dakota, Tennessee, Utah, Virginia, West Virginia, 
and Wyoming. So you've got several of these states that have this in effect, but here's the problem. Now, first of all, let me tell you the advantages. The advantages is that the cost is much less. They're very easy to set up and they, they uh, allow you much, the compliance aspect to it is much easier. The disadvantage is they don't work. That's the worst part about these. Domestic asset protection trusts do not work. And here's why. Essentially, under Article or Article 4, Section 1 of the Constitution, it's known as the full faith and credit clause of the United States Constitution, which means a state must give full faith and credit to laws, proceedings, and judgments from other states. For example, let's say you've got Nevada and Delaware and Alaska. They may, prote- they may claim to protect your assets, right? They may claim that they're going to protect your assets in the event of a lawsuit through a domestic asset protection trust. The problem, though, is that let's say you get sued in California. Well, let's say, actually, let's just put it this way. Let's say something happens in one of those states, and then you end up having a judgment brought against you in California. That other state, whatever state the lawsuit originated out of, must honor the judgment out of another state. So if you start trying to hop around, they don't really care. If something bad happens in one state, they're not going to just say, oh, you've got a domestic asset protection trust from another state. We'll honor that and not honor it here. No, full faith and credit clause says basically it eliminates the entire benefit of a domestic asset protection trust. So home state of asset controls uh, under section 10 of the Uniform Voidable uh, Transactions Act, which means the home state rules uh, controls. That means the state where the lawsuit comes and the judgment comes from is what controls. And as a result of that, you can't go borrow another state's beneficial laws trying to avoid a judgment. And so also Section 548 of the Bankruptcy uh, Code includes assets transferred to a self-settled trust within 10 years. In other words, when you set it up under a domestic asset protection trust, there's something called a look-back period, which allows the courts to be able to come back 10 years and find assets that had been exchanged during that period of time and grab a hold of those and bring them back in. So as I'm saying here, domestic asset protection trusts, they really just don't work. And, and judges just find excuses and reasons to be able to gain access to your assets. In fact, in California, here's what's crazy. There's a, a case called the Stillman case from 2012. They ruled that just the mere act of setting up an asset protection trust was ruled as evidence of a fraudulent transfer. And that, look, that's how crazy the courts are in California. They said if you try to even set up an asset protection trust, you must be just trying to commit fraud. So please understand, for an asset protection trust, yeah, they work, but extremely expensive, very difficult because you lose control of your asset. Domestic domestic asset protection trusts, well, they're very inexpensive, easy to set up, but they don't work. So what do you do? Well, here, that's why at STR Law Guys, we recommend what we call a layered asset protection strategy. You need strong insurance. If you're using rental property, you need strong commercial insurance to provide you protection. Then you need layers of asset protection, starting with each property in its own individual LLC. And then you need to use a holding company strategy, preferably either a Wyoming LLC holding company or what we prefer, the Arizona Limited Partnership holding company, that will then provide you what's called charging order protection and privacy. When you layer up your asset protection, you can still be provided protection, but yet flexibility and maintain good tax advantages as well. So listen, I hope this has been of some benefit to you, gave you a lot of law, gave you a lot of nuance here in this description. But uh, listen, if you would like to get that free ebook I mentioned earlier, Five Strategies to Protect Your Short-Term Rentals and Give You Peace of Mind, click down into the link below into the description section of the YouTube video. I'll be happy to send that over to you Uh, when you sign up for that. By the way, if you like this video, I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel, like the video, and I'll send you more great content just like this. Thanks. We'll see you on our next video.